Excellent. Okay, good. Well, as you know, we've been carrying on a series in, in Acts, uh, the book of Acts. And of course, Acts is, is not a book that stands its own. It's, it's actually the sequel to, to Luke's gospel. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus has lived. He's been baptized. He's been tested. He's called his disciples, as we heard this morning. Uh, he has taught. He's, he went to Jerusalem. He confronted the le religious leaders. He's been executed. And then he's been raised from the dead and ascended to God's right hand. Now, in Acts then, the disciples receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter has, in, in Acts chapter 1 and 2, Peter has preached his sermon on Pentecost. And several thousand have responded to this. And this is an astonishing story. But yet, it's kind of different to the story that, that the people of God were expecting. They were expecting God to return to Jerusalem. They were expecting him to come and establish his rule and his reign. They were expecting to come to, to bring healing, forgiveness, wholeness, and peace. They were expecting to reconstitute the people of God and raise the righteous to life. The dead who were uh, the righteous would be raised to life. He would pour out his spirit on all people, and even some of the Gentiles would be added on. Uh, to that, the people of God, and yet the, 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 the nations were to be judged, and evil was to be quashed. And it was to usher in this new age, this new age of a new restored creation. In short, the old, their old age of sin and death was to give way to God's new age of forgiveness, life, and shalom, or peace. That's what they expected. But the astonishing thing is what the people of God expected God to do at the end of time. He had actually begun to do in and through Jesus the Messiah in the middle of time. I'll say that again because it probably sounds a bit weird. They expected God, what they expected God to do at the end of time, they had begun to do in Jesus the Messiah in the middle of time. Yes, God had returned to, to, to Jerusalem, but in the person of his son, Jesus, he had begun to establish his reign and his rule. That's why Jesus constantly talks about the kingdom of God, his rule and his reign. And he had brought healing and forgiveness and wholeness and peace to people. And he had demonstrated that in his ministry, where he had, he had delivered and forgiven and healed people. He had reconstituted the people of God. Therefore, we have now 12 disciples, a symbolic number that signifies the people of God. They're being reconstituted and restored. And the righteous dead were indeed raised to life, of which Jesus himself was the first. The first fruits of all this resurrection now had begun in the present in Jesus. And he had poured out his spirit on all people. They'd just seen that happen. Peter was standing up trying to explain this, this what looked like a crazy thing that had happened. So crazy that they, they thought they were drunk. But they weren't. They'd received God's spirit and were speaking to the, the people assembled. And the Gentiles were being added in, in too. And the evil had been ju judged on the cross. And this new restored creation had begun. It created a new community, a new people. In short, the age of the age to come had actually broken into the present. And in Acts two, um, we were beginning this series on uh, called Heaven Sent. And last week, if you remember, David did his segment called the New Creation. And I would say, I'd recommend, if you haven't seen that, of course, there's always the YouTube, the Wellspring YouTube channel. So I'd say, if you haven't seen that one from last week, by all means, it'll, it'll be up there. So we started off with talking about a new creation. Today, we'll be talking about a new community. And next week will be a new compassion. So today will be a new community. That's what we'll be talking about. And I'll just read briefly from Acts 2, the very end, of Peter's sermon, there was a, a huge response. And then Luke, in the book of Acts, gives this little summary from verse, uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And this, this is a summary of the new community. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And that's that little summary of this new community that they've just been formed. And how is this, this new community characterised? And of course, Luke highlights four things that characterise this new community. He says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers, as he's described, by their devotion to. This is not defined, this new community. The new community is defined by their faith in Christ. But this characterises this new community. And I don't think these four things are meant to be an exhaustive list of everything that characterised them. But yet these are the four core things that they were, they were characterised by. These are four things they focused on and describes as they're devoted to. When it describes them as being devoted, devoted is, is, is quite a strong word. It's not sort of they played around with it. They didn't just dabble in it. They, they were actually devoted to these things. They gave constant attention to these things. And if anything, being devoted doesn't just imply a, a steadfastness, but it also implies a love for things. Um, devotion is often expressed, probably, you, you may have seen it, probably most, most heartbreakingly, sometimes you have a, mar a married couple and they're, and they're getting quite old. And one of the, the, the couple will sometimes be, be sometimes quite uh, infirm or quite ill. And the other, the other spouse will devote themselves to looking after that person because they promised many years ago at their wedding vows to look after them in sickness and in health. And sometimes the sickness comes as you get older. Uh, and this is a, an expression of the devotion of one to another, of one spouse to another, that they care for them. Daily, they care for them. Steadfastly, they care for them. They care for them under all circumstances, even when they're tired, even when they're burned out, even when they're they're quite depressed, maybe at sometimes the prospect, you know, of another day where they have to work hard, but yet they are devoted to them because that love drives them. That love drives them to look after their spouse. And that's the kind of devotion we're talking about here. It's not one of duty, but of love. Love drives them to, uh, to embrace the apostles' teaching, to meet as a fellowship, to break bread together and to pray together. So what was the apostles' teaching, just to sort of start us off? What was this apostles' teaching that actually sounded so, so different, so attractive, so compelling? Um, and if you look through the book of Acts, um, the apostles' teachings often recorded in sermons by the various people at various times when they're hauled in front of the, the, the religious leaders. Sometimes they give an account of what they're doing and they, they give an account, they give a strong account of what they're doing. And this, this would characterize the apostles' teaching. And what we find in the apostles' teaching, it's actually not that difficult it's the events of what they had seen and witnessed they had seen they had seen jesus and they had come to recognize that he was god's messiah he was a king of david's line and he had worked powerfully he had brought the healing and forgiveness and deliverance what we would sometimes call salvation and he had demonstrated that in his ministry he was crucified by the religious leaders and yet a crucified Messiah is no Messiah. He's, he's seen in the eyes of the world as a failure. That was one of the things where many Messiahs at the time of, of Jesus who came and went, but of course they weren't Messiahs because they ended up dead on a Roman cross. And yet the, the apostles are proclaiming that they had seen Jesus raised. And this was God's vindication that he really was the Messiah. He was the king of David's line, yes, but he was raised to life. Death could not hold him. 
because he was God's chosen, because he was his Messiah. And he was ascended, he was raised to life, and he was ascended to God's right hand. And therefore he was the, the world's <coughs> true Lord and true King. It's kind of interesting because we're, we're, in many ways, we're familiar with the story. We, we know that Jesus died and Jesus is risen, but sometimes the, the ascension gets kind of dropped off. You know, we, we're all familiar with Easter. You know, Easter is the core of our, our Christian calendar when Jesus died and is risen. And we also, of course, as, as a Pentecostal church, we, you know, we're, we're familiar with Pentecost and we celebrate that. But somehow the ascension just kind of drops off. It's never really noticed. I mean, can any of us remember when Ascension Day was? We can remember when Easter Day was. We can remember Pentecost was. When is the Ascension Day? Um, yeah, it's sometime after it. <laughs> but yet the Ascension is something that, that, that declares that Jesus is the, the world's true Lord and King. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is vindicated and he rules from that realm. He is the true King. And of course, that demands response. If Jesus is Lord and King, as Dan pointed out a few weeks ago, Caesar isn't, and the, the rulers of this world are not the true Lord. Jesus is that true Lord. And yet, the, what is the response? Well, the response is that we turn. We turn around, away from our old life, and embrace a new life by following him. And that is our response. And the response is often very painfully obvious in Acts where, where even some quite confrontational. Sometimes Peter points and says, well, you did this, you crucified him. But if you turn now, turn your back on that, turn your way, <clears throat> turn your face towards Jesus, he will bring the salvation and new life that you badly need. And that forms this core of the apostles' teaching Jesus as Lord and King, the one who has died and is raised, and the one whom we must respond to because he is the Lord's true King, and we want to serve him alone. And of course, there's much, much more as the apostles develop their teaching. We find that in their letters and so on. But that is the core of it, of the apostles' teaching. So that was one aspect of, the, of their well, what characterized them. The second was is their fellowship together. And this fellowship, this word kononia, it, it's a kind of, it's, it's not just fellowship. Fellowship in English is quite a sort of a bit of a limp word. It's not a very strong word, uh, but yet the, this other word in, in Greek is quite strong. It's more than a fellowship, it's a partnership. It's a community where relationships are built and maintained. It's something that is living and dynamic. And of course, expresses itself in concrete ways and generosity towards one another and helping one another and so on. And I, I don't want to get into too much about the this generosity that was expressed and the compassion that is expressed because that is where we're going next week. But that is a concrete ex expression of that. And of course, when Jesus ministered and talked, um, this fellowship is different in character. It's upside down. He, he constantly told parables that the, the greatest among you is the least. The greatest is the slave. The greatest is the servant. The greatest is the one who has faith like a little child. Not the clever, not the smart, not the high status people, but the ones who are least who are the servants. And of course, this new community, it's a community where there should not be barriers. The traditional barriers of community, the divide, should be gone. They should not exist. I mean, the barriers of that age, of that time, were the division between Jew and Gentile. That was a huge barrier. Jews would not mix with Gentiles. That had nothing to do with them. They saw them as unclean. But now their faith in Christ meant that they had to remove that marriage and embrace them as brothers and sisters in Christ, their Savior. The barriers between Greek and barbarian of cultural values were broken down. Of slave and free, of male and female, 
of rich and poor, all the statuses and all the things that we put in place to set ourselves above others should be gone. They no longer exist. They no longer have relevance. They no longer, if anything, they should no longer have a hold on us. And it's good to see within our society that the whole kind of gender wars, if you want to call them that, you know, the, the, the traditional roles of male having everything are now being strongly challenged and, and, and females and women are now being looked to get true equality. And of course, that's true of race as well. People are challenging strongly the fact that, that white privilege is no longer acceptable, that race is no longer something that you divide. We should be colorblind, it doesn't matter. But yet, and all these good things that society is doing to remove those barriers, there's one thing that, that disturbs me, and that is the, the rise of nationalism as well. That's something that's rising. You know, the barriers of us and them, and our nation is better than yours, and we want to be free of your nation, and all those kinds of things. And leaders are starting to embrace the flag, literally and metaphorically. They're starting to wave the flag vigorously. But flags ultimately divide. Yes, they're only a symbol, but just burn one, burn a flag and see what happens. And people will be infuriated because that's seen as a slur and a, and a put down. But yet nationalism is on the rise. And what I was, what I was kind of, I'll give myself an example. Um, it's always interesting in how People like ourselves, I'll take it myself as an example, who, who love the, the place where we come from, who, who love it deeply in Northern Ireland. We love the place. But yet it was so brilliant. Why did I go away and leave it? Expats are often the ones who love to fly the flag most fervently. But yet that place <clears throat> is a place divided by flags and nationalism. And it's a, it's a cancer in our society. And yet as the people of God, we are defined. Our identity is not in flags, not in nations, not in status, but in Jesus. He's the Messiah. He is the true Lord that we follow. So education and race and gender and all those status and things that the, the world would put value in become meaningless in this new community as a true fellowship where all are equal. Well, that's the ideal. Let, let's hope and pray that we can actually live this out. Now, I think one of the other things that characterized them was the breaking of bread. And it's been great this morning that we, we've shared that together. And we don't just do it because Jesus told us. <laughs> I mean, obviously he did, but yet we do it because essentially it's a freedom meal. It's a, pa a Passover was a freedom meal. Well, God's people were set free and they marked it as the blood of the lamb over the doorposts in a way back in the time of Exodus. And of course, we now have that renewed and restored and made fresh in, in, in Jesus who brings us the freedom that we, we deserve, or we, we do not deserve, that we desire. That freedom becomes ours in Christ. That's the salvation meal, the one who saves. And we look to that as, as, the, as the core of our, our community. We celebrate that. Yes, there is a sense in which it is a solemn occasion because it, it is Christ's death that we, we remember. But also it's a, it's a celebration because it looks forward. So it has that dual component of we look back and remember and as, as Anne said this morning, we look forward, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, and we look forward and we celebrate this till he comes. So we look forward to his return. We look forward to the time when his kingdom is fully inaugurated, is fully complete. And we celebrate that together because he is the, the one who will rule and reign and bring that peace and wholeness that we, 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 we expect, we long for. We lament that it is not here yet. And that meal becomes a celebration of that. And ultimately that meal shows us that 
that evil is defeated not in, in, in guns, not in strength, not in armies, not in wars, but in self-sacrifice. That's how evil is defeated. And that is a completely different way again. We, that meal is a reminder that we do not operate on the same principles of the world. We do not operate with, with violence and aggression. We operate with love and self-sacrifice. And that defines our community. And remember that in, in the breaking of bread. And of course, the final bit, the final part was the, the, the prayers. Prayer defines our people. And yes, we're devoted to prayer. We should be devoted to prayer like Jesus was. And I guess myself, like many of us, would not think that we are masters of prayer, that we are not <laughs> eloquent enough in prayer, we are not steadfast enough in prayer, we are not devoted to prayer. But yet, Jesus was as well, and we follow in his footsteps, we follow him. We find and look that, that often that, that Jesus set himself aside. He took himself off to pray because he needed God to speak, direct, to guide. And indeed, prayer is mentioned over 400 times in the Bible. Prayer is such and saturated in all that goes on. And of course, we, we, we pray because prayer changes us. God shapes us when we, we, we pray because it takes our attention off ourselves and we turn it around to him. We praise him, we thank him, as, as Fiona has helped us this morning, that, that prayer is often just pouring out our thanks to God. And it shapes us to an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude. But of course, God change, uh, prayer changes our circumstances because God shapes the world. He shapes us and he shapes the world when we pray. And that's an astonishing thought that somehow when we pray that God changes things. <laughs> but yet it's something that we not just read of in scripture, we have experienced in our lives. So that, that's another aspect. And it's kind of funny because uh, we've been having the, the, the prayer meetings on Zoom on, on Thursday night. and and. Obviously, sometimes we're, we're, we're living a lot of time on our Zoom. Zoom can, if you're on Zoom a lot, you can get pretty tired. And on Thursday night, we're going to have a prayer meeting. And I was thinking, oh, no, I've got to go on Zoom one more time this week. And I'm living on Zoom. I wish you could just give the Zoom thing up. And we met together on Thursday night. And it was really good. <laughs> and it, sometimes God does that. You know, you just kind of think, oh, I can't be doing with this tonight. And then we met together. And we prayed together uh, and on Zoom. Yes, it was one more time in Zoom, but it was a really good, warm evening of fellowship where we prayed for one another, for homeless in Watford, and a whole variety of other things for, for things that were going on. It was just a really good good meeting, a really good encouraging meeting. God worked, and, and he changed me in that because I was just thinking, oh, I'm not another one. And yet it was just great to be together. So how can we grow in these things? You know, how can we grow in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer? What can we do differently or better? Um, the apostles' teaching, we need to soak ourselves in scripture as individuals and as a church. Um, because there's so much in the world that we're exposed to that would try and replace our values with a different set of values. They would try and replace the values of the kingdom of God with the kingdoms of a king, the values of this world. And we need to be constantly refreshed. We constantly need our values to people to be put right side up, so that we understand the values and we are drenched in them and we live by them. And our first thought and decision is to is just to go along with those values, to be informed by them and to live by them. We need to be reshaped in that, in that likeness of Jesus. And of course, we find Jesus in scripture. That's God's word and in the apostles' teaching, which took directly from the ministry of Jesus. And we're, we're, going, to, we're going to be launching a, a grow group soon during the day. And I invite all of you to, to think about doing that. One, one of those grow groups will be 
you know, uh, scripture and the Bible study will play a significant part in that. And just invite you to, to think about that. It's, it's again, just to, to study God's word and be transformed and be changed from it. The fellowship, now there's, there's so much you could say about this one, you know, there's the whole sense of sharing, the challenge of sharing financially together and the vulnerability and trust that that brings. But yet, of course, if it was to kind of pontificate now about that, that would somehow take away from next next Sunday. So I don't want to go into that one too much, I'll to set the scene and say, if we want to find out a little bit more as to how we can live out these values next Sunday, we, sh we will be exploring that more, that new generosity, that new compassion, which, which being in fellowship brings. And the breaking of bread, you know, it's good that we celebrate that. And it's, it's good that we do that regularly, as, as I kind of said, to, to set Jesus at the center of that. Not just in looking back to his death, but looking forward to his coming again. And let's continue to celebrate his breaking the bread when we meet together, uh, no matter how that is. And of course, the prayers are, are, you know, prayer individually, we need to be changed by that. We need to be growing in that. And, and the Thursday night Zoom thing, yes, it's another Zoom one, but it, it is encouraging, it is good. It is, it is helpful, it is transforming. And just to finish, what was the impact of all this? Um, this new community that lived these four core values, what was the impact? And of course, it tells us that the, the, the people around were, were, were in reverence and awe at what God was doing. And God was at work powerfully. It talks about wonders and signs that were done through the, the, the apostles. And we want, want to see more of that. We want to see God at work powerfully and our prayers answered and, and changing us. And that sharing materially, we'll explore a bit more of that next week. And of course, there were a growing community. It says about the Lord added to their number daily, those who were being saved. God worked and he grew them, not just as individuals, but also as a community. They were being transformed and, and really just my prayer would be that we would become shaped in that way but that like that community and, and grow in that way like that community let's and i just hand back to you and to say yes let, let's pray for these things let, let's ask god to, to make us a community like that